Welcome, everybody, to the New Liar podcast. I'm here with my guest, Matthew Arid, who is a journalist who specializes in intelligence and geopolitical matters. He's the founder of the Canadian Patriot website, and he's also a co-founder of the Rising Tide Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to enhancing intercultural dialogue and understanding uh, with a special focus on the arts and sciences. Uh, so we have a very fascinating guest today. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Edgar Allan Poe, which I think is really a critical, critical subject when it comes to the question of the arts and culture today. And I think we just have to state it outright. The arts and culture are in a crisis right now. There is a crisis in popular culture. There is a crisis in uh, poetry. There's been a certain arc of development, uh, starting with modern, the advent of modernism, which sort of broke with the classical tradition as it had been uh, represented best, I'd say by people like Percy Bysshe Shelley, John Keats, Edgar Allan Poe, and before that, Shakespeare, Dante, Homer, and everything sort of revolves around these kinds of titans. There's all, we, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of poets, different kinds of artists, which have drawn on some of these seminal uh, poetic geniuses throughout history. And with modernism, there was sort of a break with that, and we were going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And we've discussed all the problems and paradoxes with that in the in previous podcasts. So I think today it's really important to get at this question: Who was Edgar Allan Poe really? Because in popular culture, till this day, the image of Edgar Allan Poe is largely reduced to this cartoonish Halloween like uh, figure of the macabre, which, you know, we pull out every October uh, to sort of get feel all spooky and, you know, feel all sorts of strange feelings uh, and just have a bit of novelty to throw into our our mix of, of, of the daily grind. But Edgar Allan Poe is actually one of the greatest poets, not because he spook people with all sorts of, you know, Halloween like uh, themes, but actually because he had a conception of poetry as something that was awakening that those, those deeper faculties within human beings, the creative faculties. And he called this soup. He, he, he was referred to this in many of his essays, including on the poetic principle, uh, on the philosophy of composition. And he's always talking about this uh, thirst for immortality, the, the longing for supernal loveliness. So these are very important concepts, which I think in, in modern times, people have sort of, let's put it this way, people, the idea of art today is really just reaction, it's largely reactionary and it's not really drawing on uh, or it doesn't really recognize like a Poe would or a Shelley that there is something higher within human beings which is universal, which we can all tap into. And that this universal fount of creativity is really the thing that sets us apart from animals. It's, it's the thing that makes discoveries, right? It's what is associated with what we call inspiration. And Poe understood that you, if you couldn't awake this within a citizenry, there's no way that you could maintain uh, a republic. There's no way that you could really maintain uh, a, 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 an advanced civilization if human beings were not able to conceive of beautiful and impassioned conceptions in the realms of the arts. If they weren't in a position to do that, uh, then they weren't really going to be able to pursue that in the real world. The, the, the realm of the arts was really the, the ground zero for sort of inspiring uh, and communicating ideas. So I think I've gone on long enough, and I apologize for that. 
but there's so there's there's a lot of layers that we have to uncover, Matthew. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I don't think you went on uh, too long at all. I think that it's very important that people at least get that idea, that essence of Poe before we actually start um, unpacking things a little bit. And indeed, you know, you brought up the uh, the master of the macabre, this perverse image that people uh, popularly encounter every Halloween of Poe, um, which is a real uh, perversion and derailment of any understanding of what Poe actually was himself, how he saw himself and what he did, what he contributed to the wealth of human knowledge on almost every uh, field of the arts and also of, of sciences. Um, and I think that a big part of this has to do with the fact that um, we are in our society currently, we're in many crises and many of those crises and our inability to resolve those crises, whether it's the, the danger of civil war inside of the United States currently, um, which I think a lot of people on the left and on the right are thinking seriously about the world is, is watching. Um, you know, we have certain issues of, of war. Um, thermonuclear war is a real danger. I mean, you know, nations have been encircled by uh, the United States increasingly over the last several years, um, which is part of a real game of nuclear chicken that nobody should be playing. But uh, our inability to resolve these and many other problems has to do with our ignorance of universal history and, and the actual long-term processes that shape the context in which we find ourselves, which is universal historic processes. And people often find it very difficult because of the education system, the, you know, a lot of the, the assumptions that we're, we're fed in our, our current zeitgeist, they find it difficult to think how events that happened 100 or 200 or 300 years ago or, or more are actually causally affecting the world that they live in. So to understand Poe, one needs to really understand that the United States itself in which he situated himself as an epistemological warrior and defender um, from a very early age. Um, but the United States itself arose as a very new phenomenon of how to organize society, how to organize our idea of law that we enact for our own self-government, um, that the founding fathers, especially Benjamin Franklin, who many could say was the, the, the father of founding fathers, um, they, they, this was recognized as the creation of a new type of human being that for the first time, rather than being uh, seen as human cattle under a feudal Lord's estate or monarchy's estate under hereditary institutions where your children and grandchildren would be condemned to the same fate that you lived, um, which includes also the elite as well, born into a noble class, they would be sort of uh, always, your bloodline was seen as the validation of your authority to rule over the many. Uh, right. That type of stratification of society was seen as obsolete finally, and the manifestation of that was in the form of the, the creation of the Declaration of Independence that enshrined a nation under God as though every human being, it was built on the understanding that every human being was sovereign, had inalienable rights, and, um, and these were endowed by their creator, and so rights were not given to the, the masses, they were there already, and the idea was that for this to endure beyond the generations of those who fought and, and died for uh, the creation of the, the Republic, you had to have certain cultural institutions uh, that would ensure that this would not be forgotten, but would be re rebirthed and revived with every passing generation. Mm. Otherwise, I mean, <clears throat> it's just ink on parchment, right? It, it would, th that society, if it lost the connection to those creative, bold and brave um, originating principles and ideals that the that animated that generation that fought, if, if people lost touch that in their hearts, what would happen? They would be open for corruption. They would undo uh, a lot of those sacrifices and ultimately the enemies of the, of the Republic who never went away after 1776 or 1783 when the Peace of Paris was established, those enemies um, that represented the old hereditary institutions would, would take advantage of that weakness um, and induce the nation to, to be corrupted from within. So the question of whether, how a, a, a real Renaissance culture could be established that would embody the best qualities of the human condition in the arts, in poetry, in the literature uh, that would help maintain that intergenerational continuity was a, a, a very serious thing that many, many of the founding fathers were thinking about which is why certain things were created like the Society of Cincinnati uh, by Alexander Hamilton, um, in which a, a young Marquis de Lafayette, who uh, led in, in bringing in France into su uh, supporting the USA, 
uh, right. was, a, was a leading member of and became a leading figure, uh, which plays into Poe's life very, very seriously 50 years later. But Lafayette, Lafayette as many um, know, <clears throat> was the young general with the young age of like 18 came to the United States to fight. And uh, the Society of Cincinnati was set up as an organization that would be open to all children, sons, grandsons of uh, officers of the revolution. And um, <clears throat> Poe's own, Edgar Allan Poe's own grandfather, David Poe, was a leading ally and friend of, of Marquis Lafayette and George Washington, um, in whose home Marquis Lafayette set up some of his early uh, battles with the British. Um, I, and then, sorry, this is this is really something, um, and I, I probably didn't actually formally mention that. Yes, you you've already given a great presentation, uh, which is what we're we're in part going to be touching on on the political connections, the yes. intelligence connections of Edgar Allan Poe, and I mean, especially today, there's this this trend of wanting to sort of separate the artist and his his or her work from the world in which they were actually acting in and living in, right? There's a, in a, you have this thing, new criticism, which uh, took, uh, arose with modernism. And the idea was a close reading that you could forget about the historical, philosophical, political uh, implications or contexts in which something is being written just focus on the text, just focus on the words, just focus on the feelings that all these things make you feel, but don't really talk about any sort of external idea, which may have been an impetus for the kind of writing that the quality of writing at a, at a more fundamental level. And so there's this, there's been, especially in the 20th century, um, it's really been entrenched where just look at the text, don't think about all these things. But what you're saying now is that Poe's grandfather, right? What was his name? David Poe? David Poe. Was connected to not only the, uh, the, the American uh, revolutionary, uh, I mean, what would you call it? The founding fathers? Mm -hmm. the, directly? Yeah. Directly. He was in the army. Um, but Poe was associated with, uh, or Poe had connections, family connections with Lafayette right, with leaders in the uh, war of the American Revolution against the British Empire. That's right. That's Always right. acting within this context. That's right. right. And I think it's important. It, it's not like people have this whole thing with poetry and politics. Nobody's saying that the poetry has to be political per se. And I guess you did throw in quite a few things there. Um, about, you know, the, the geopolitical situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important. We're not a political podcast as such, but we are interested in understanding how the mind of poets, how the mind of a creative genius works. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at that without any, you want, if you want to ignore all historical context, you want to ignore all the historical uh, or all the biographical or every other outside detail other than the literal text or the direct work. Sure, you can do that, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't be surprised if today there's a fundamental lack of inspiration. There's a lack of purpose in a lot of artists because there's really just this, there's just feelings, there's novelty, but at a deeper level, yeah. the sense of a historical identity, which you can find in a Dante, in a Shakespeare, in a Poe, in a Homer, in a Shelley, yeah. in a Keats, in a Beethoven, in yeah. a Mozart. Yeah. They don't have that. Yeah. They don't see themselves on the stage of history. Yeah. Right? They're saying, these are my feelings. And well, I mean, I can't judge you. Those are your feelings. You know, congrat we all have feelings. It's not like I can judge them on, oh, you have good feelings or bad feelings. No. Right. So there are ideas underlying poetry and we have to be mindful of that. And I, I think we'll talk about this a bit later and I'll, I'll read. I think it, it'll be helpful to actually hear some of Poe's works uh, off the page and get a sense of the quality that he was actually reaching for that in a sense, it's very, it is political or it has major political implications mm -hmm. just by virtue of the fact that it's going to awake something within human beings, which is necessary 
if they're to be able to struggle with concepts like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yeah. or justice, not as just some word or some construct, construct, but something that as the American uh, uh, founding fathers, as the Declaration of Independence asserts, are actually ingrained within the universe. Yeah. These are not just abstract concepts. If you are living in a society that denies its citizens justice, if you live in an oligarchical system, these systems collapse. Every mm -hmm. empire has collapsed. And I mean, I'm sure historians today, oh, well, this one collapsed because of this, this one collapsed because of that. They're just going to sort of go down into the, the, you know, the micro and sort of try and come up for an explanation for each one. But very few of them are going to recognize, well, ultimately, these had to collapse because they were going against natural law. And there was no way that you can just run an empire forever, yeah. which is some of these utopian yeah. type thinkers believe you can just we're going to establish this perfect oligarchical system that doesn't change that you know keeps everybody contented and i think that we're gonna we're gonna really jump into that uh later on in our discussion where i, I know uh, you wanted to talk about eureka um right. as, as poe's last and, and lesser known essay but probably the most important of the essays that he's ever he'd ever written um which he actually called a prose poem and, and that that gets directly at what you're saying there about the issue of the creative thought of an in, of every individual having this potential that has to be actualized in a, in a in any society morally fit to survive, those right. eurekas have to be made available for every individual to access, um, in order to feed back into the society's overall ability to to exist and succeed in a world of diminishing returns. Because at every moment, whenever you at any fixed set of 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 knowledge base, there's always a certain limited amount of resources that that society uh, can draw upon from nature. And if you don't have creative thought constantly animating and reanimating that society, discovering new resources and what have you, that society will always fall into points of increasing tension and uh, ultimately collapses what you've described every empire sort of slams into and they can't resolve. How do you maintain control politically while overcoming this, this limit to growth? They can't do it. And so they ultimately disassociate themselves through inner conflict, inner contradictions, what have you. So we could talk about that and unpack that more later on. But for the for the current discussion, I think what you were also saying um, about the the new criticism as, as and modernism <clears throat> as as a just a total mental um, castration, right? Um, that we've submitted to ourselves in our in our uh, academic analysis of the arts is really really insightful. Because yeah, to, the idea that you could extract the personality and the identity um, of the artist or the scientist, but I guess in the case of new criticism, it applies more to the arts, but that you could extract their identity and how they thought of themselves and what motivated them from the actual effect of their identity and their, their, their goals, which was the arts that they created is, is just, it's, why would you do that? Like, if you think about even, I, I mentioned the sciences, but Ben Franklin was not only the, the founding father or the father of founding fathers, but he was also a leading scientist of the world. They called him the Prometheus of America, but he was also a poet with his poor Richard's Almanac. He, he really, really a patro uh, was a patron of the arts. He understood this very seriously, this need to create a, right. a, a, a quality of artistic culture in every field um, and worked hard to actually do it in the course of his life and, and create institutions beyond, which ultimately uh, Poe and many painters even uh, tapped into and, and uh, uh, really benefited from but you know he if you try to say oh yeah i like i like his discovery of electricity but i'm not a fan of his political theory it's like well okay that's your opinion but he if you actually like look at ben franklin's own mind and writings didn't separate the two he recognized that in order for his political um concepts his moral concepts to be uh made realizable he had to discover something incredibly paradigm shifting in the form of his, he focused on electricity and what was its nature um, that would then allow for an, an opening of potential to then allow his ideals of uh, having a Republic uh, be created. That could then happen, but it had to happen in an, in a lawful way. So his discovery of electricity was part of that. And I think just like Dante Alighieri, you could find his work politically. He was at a certain point, one of the highest, um, he was, he was a very high level political official within the Florentine Republic. Yeah. Huh? 
within the Florentine Republic. Within the yeah. Florentine Republic, yeah, he was like one of the highest uh, political officials, and and in his work artistically, uh, was was totally intermeshed with his understanding that you needed to create a society of of citizens that could think for themselves and had a had a symmetrical, full balance of their minds and emotions, right. um, in order to process the types of philosophical ideas and ideals that they needed to internalize in order to uh, be sovereign individuals, right, to shape their own destiny. Um, so it, it, to, to, to simply extract somebody's, the effects of somebody's life from who they were and what motivated them is just, um, it's either incompetent or criminal. I, I think if you knew that this is a lie, but you, you encourage this type of analysis in the schools for political motives, which is, I think where this stuff tends to come from, if you really dig into things, um, right. it's bad. So back to Poe. Well, Matthew, uh, you are you you are one controversial a bit, uh, controversial uh, individual here. I I I want to address our listeners because <laughs> a lot has been said right there, and I think a lot of it is very nuanced. You know, Num- number one, nobody is espousing some kind of Puritan or moralist dogma that a poet or artist has to have such and such a belief. It's quite the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. We're but. And we need to get into that, but we also mentioned the, uh, right. I think you put it very nicely when you said you can't divorce the identity from the work. I feel like that, that starts to get pathological. If you want to say that, yeah, this person's sense of identity uh, had nothing to do with what they ended up writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's completely, that's, I'm sorry, but that's just, uh, you know, that's nuts. Mm-hmm. Right. Your sense of identity is ultimately what informs your behavior and your morals. Right. Mm-hmm. If you just think if somebody thinks we're all just animals, we're all just more developed animals, but we're all ultimately just driven by and uh, the product of our instincts and uh, our immediate instincts and impulses. Yeah. How are you going to behave in society? Yeah. Right. What is politics going to be for you? It's just going to be a Hobbesian sort of social Darwinist uh, hellscape, ultimately. Right. You're just going to try and get as much as you can for yourself, as much wealth, as much pleasure, as much um, as much fame or whatever it is that gets you going. But it's it's going to be. A society based on those kind of principles, number one, is not going to last long. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, I was watching because we are talking about intelligence uh, and the, the relationship that poets have had and have always had in terms of uh, their political identities, which in the 20th century, we've tried to really disabuse people from exactly this question of forming some, ide- having an identity that sort of informs your uh, your work or what, what is the relationship? We can just say that. What is the relationship? Some poets and artists were less political than others, yeah. but what we find in all the greatest is their commitment to creativity, yep. their commitment to a certain image of human nature, which is not bestial, right? right. And it's an image of human nature where we are capable of conceiving of ideas, which are not something material, but something immaterial. And because of that, right, the whole idea of poetry, why would you write poetry? It's because you're trying to address something that you can't talk about in literal terms, that you cannot directly uh, uh, define, but yet you know exists. And the whole essence of the poetic process or the poetic method is about addressing this higher um, these higher ideas, whatever they may be, you know, there are hymns to Eros by Sappho, or there are, you know, odes to a Grecian urn by Keats, and there are many ballads by Poe or, uh, you know, Shelley Keats, mm-hmm. which speak to this higher thing. Yep. Right. They're trying to find a way to express it. Yep. And so that's why they're developing the kinds of poetic language that they are. It's not just because they want to create nice words and beauty or to the extent that that is the goal. It's because one recognizes that that awakens something within. Yeah. That if you are to recognize something is actually beautiful, which people say is beautiful and are moved by, the only way they could have the ability to experience something like that 
is if they already had a capacity existing within themselves to recognize it. Yeah. Because if they didn't already have the, if they didn't have the, if they were just animals, if they were just brutes, right, which did not have such an, uh, a capacity within them, beauty would not be a thing for them. Nobody would have that, wow, what was that? But and here's it's the thing. Glimpses, here's the thing, though. The, the difficult thing to, uh, because a lot of people would hear what you just said and they would say, well, if you were going to be an artist trying to bring that out, then you would be moralistic or didactic because to, you could easily just sound yeah. like a, a priest, you know, uh, telling people what they should or shouldn't be. And, you know, yeah. you should be more divine and more really not what we're of your virtues. Shame on you if you're not, you know, and, and there are art, arts that do that. That is but, the problem. Then that's the problem, right? It really does a disservice to the actual uh, ideal of what you've just set forth. Because so, how does a real um, artist, meritus of the name, actually do that effectively, such that he can invoke or she can invoke that type of um, transformation in, a, in in individuals who experience their art? Um, right. It can't be done if they're told that they should or shouldn't do something, or if it's done out of like you know, in a Kantian sort of I, I must. Uh, be good type of motive <clears throat> yeah. um that's just naive um but what they they can do and what they do do um whether it's uh shakespeare or whether it's poe um and this is what causes a lot of people to i think be a little bit confused about what they're actually doing in their tragedies or in their their works of art that result in very dissonant negative effects and, and um outcomes for the protagonists on the stage or in the in the short stories is that they they you can, they can investigate what happens when a soul is uh, sick when you have somebody who has potential, but rather than having a a, a well balanced integrated um, persona where they've matured their um, their 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 passions in harmony with their reason, rather right. than doing that, which would allow them to be creative and have insight and to solve problems, rather than having that 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 type of personality in a Hamlet, or in the case of Poe, um, as one of the figures from uh, in Descent of the Maelstrom, or The Imp of the Perverse, or, or many of the other sort of disturbing black cat uh, type of stories, rather than have, they have somebody who's out of whack with themselves, they're in, in contradiction with themselves, right? They, they lie, them, they tell themselves false narratives, and they lie about what they think they are. And and that causes a complete ignorance in insight and ultimately um, actions that are motivated by passions that lead to self-destruction, both for the people that they're interacting with as well as themselves, ultimately. Um, whether it's Telltale Heart is a great example, right? That person who killed that old man he was taking care of because that eye was just like looking at him and he just started obsessing over it. Poe is taking you into the mind of this person who's profoundly sick in the head. And he conducts this, this so-called perfect kill to get rid of the voice and the eye uh, from haunting him. And ultimately, at a certain point, just breaks down in front of the cops that he invites in for tea, you know, almost taunting fate and can't stop hearing the throbbing, this beating of this heart, which, you know, you don't know if it's, if it's, if it's the heart that he's imagining under the floorboards of the person he killed or whether it's his own heart. That's the telltale heart. And he ultimately breaks down and ad effectively admits what he just did. And he's, you know, his life is over effectively, you know, and the same thing you could, you could analyze, analyze that from these first person narratives that he takes you through into the mind of a, a person who's really sick in the head and sick in the heart in many of these pieces. Uh, Shakespeare does the same thing with Hamlet or Macbeth um, or any of his tragedies. He's investigating the same thing. So you can then, he doesn't tell you, you shouldn't be like that, but he's helping you He's putting dissonances into the reader's uh, mm. own soul that the reader then cannot just shake off and just walk out as if they just saw a movie and was like, oh, that was entertaining. No, that stays with you. And you have to All think right. about that. And then in the act of thinking about that and vicariously having experienced that person on the stage who acted that way, you find a little bit of that, that character inside of yourself, usually, right. if you're sensitive to it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so... The, the idea that Poe is just um, a perverse figure or that Shakespeare just loves, you know, horror as well, which people often get slandered by, this is the effect of the assassination of legacy. So rather than killing an individual, which has a sort of sometimes temporal uh, necessary effect in the mind of, of uh, an imperialist or somebody seeking 
to dominate the world, they, they, they don't tend to enjoy the, the effect of these Promethean characters who tend to rise up. You know, I mentioned Benjamin Franklin was known as the Prometheus of America who stole fire from the gods to share it with men. This type of uh, Zeusian personality type that r- expresses it once themselves in the form of empires. Uh, they don't tend to like these Promethean character types that tend to arise, whether it's a Dante, whether it's a Beethoven, whether it's a, a Poe. And so rather than simple or a Shakespeare, but so rather than just simply killing an individual, which sometimes does happen, what's more useful to them is the killing of the legacy and the memory of that person. So people will read the establishment, highly publicized um, uh, biographies uh, talking about the life and motives of Ben Franklin, the tinkering freak right. womanizer. Um, <clears throat> and they'll be totally scrambled in the head. To under- they won't be able to access through that filter that's been given to them who and what Ben Franklin was. So they won't be able to, to tap into that source inside of themselves that Ben Franklin himself had tapped into. Um, and it's the same thing for uh, Poe. So there's been a lot, if you look at, you know, you, you mentioned one of these um, conferences that, that both you and I and, and Cynthia Chung, uh, my wife and, and co-founder with the Rising Tide Foundation, the three of us, we, we had uh, this great experience organizing this conference on uh, the Poe You Never Knew a year and a half ago at uh, a university in Montreal. And each one of us, we tackled a different aspect of Poe's life. And people can go to our website on the risingtidefoundation.net and, and listen to all of those presentations. Um, I tackled the sort of political historical context. Uh, Cynthia tackled the uh, the case study of the imp of the perverse and what he's doing uh, in in that story as one of main uh, stories. Korean profiles, essentially. Huh? Poe's own take on all these different kinds of Shakespearean profiles, right? He's just giving it his own. Uh, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you had uh, taken up the challenge of really just unpacking um, the underappreciated side of Poe's poetic uh, persona and what he was doing with his insights into the poetic principle. And, and all three, I think, worked together very nicely. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in my part of the presentation, what I got across and I opened with was that, you know, Poe's legacy is highly contaminated. And even many Poe scholars today agree, with, they, they will admit this, that the authoritative biographer who shaped the uh, image that we're currently given of this opium addict fiend um, obsessed with death and the macabre was actually his own political enemy in life, uh, Rufus Griswold, who um, devoted, I mean, they were living enemies in their own time in 1842, 1843, Poe died in 1848 um, or the beginning of 1849, sorry. And, uh, but they were living enemies um, so the fact that uh, as the moment Poe died, this figure who hated him, and you could see that in, in his um, obituary that was published all across America when Poe died, um, it's full of venomous hate for Poe, where he basically slanders him that early on. His body is barely even cold. Yeah. And, um, and, and Griswold in this obituary is characterizing him as like a selfish misanthrope who hated humanity and only did things for his own greed and self-serving gain. Um, like, and yet we're told that Poe granted Griswold the authority to control all of, to be his literary executor and control all of his, his letters and writings. I mean, my God, uh, why would we, anybody assume that that's true? And and Griswold used this authority to acquire through payment to, uh, Poe's uh, mother-in-law, all of Poe's letters, all of the, 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 the writings that, that existed were all granted to Griswold, believing that he was going to write this beautiful biography. Again, right. I would have believed that I, that's another question. But um, of course, at this point, um, that's the biography that then feeds into generations of researchers uh, year after year. And it's admitted that, that Griswold lied. Even every Poe scholar today... Uh, who's, I mean, everyone that I've looked at admits that he lied profusely, that he forged some of the letters. That seems to be also uh, generally agreed upon by most. There's a bit of controversy there, but you actually look at these letters and yeah, a lot of evidence that these, there's, many of them are forged uh, right. and onward and onward. So you're like, why? Why would they work so hard to maintain a false image, a legacy, a legacy assassination? Um, and so that becomes answerable when you start looking at the, again, start with the political context. So we were shaping um, 
David Poe, right? What is the, the world going through with the rupture of, of the, right. re, the Republican revolution and the creation of this new type of society um, premised around the a different idea of, of human nature that awoke different characteristics that were impossible to awaken under a feudal structure of Europe or empire where there was constant wars of divide and conquer. So uh, Poe, as, an, as a young man, um, he ends up being, he, he's introduced to Lafayette when Lafayette is in, in the United States, um, doing a, a many months long tour organizing, um, not only for the victory of John Quincy Adams, who was the only real major um, serious patriotic Republican intellectual who was fighting for the presidency and fighting to save the United States from its own uh, destruction, which was being orchestrated by figures that I go through in, in some of my writings. Um, but so Lafayette wants to meet David Poe, but David Poe is dead, right? Poe's grandfather. And so uh, he goes to David's house, David Poe's house. A young Poe then is made part of his, his uh, youth guard who accompanies Lafayette throughout his entire voyage where he meets all sorts of revolutionaries who are organizing. These are, again, all members of the Society of Cincinnati that, that, uh, that Lafayette is the international leader of at this point, especially for right. the European side of things. And uh, this changes Poe's life. Um, he immediately after, after Lafayette returns back to Europe where he's organizing, Lafayette is in the midst of organizing an international network of movements from Poland and Spain and Germany to um, shake off the shackles of the Carlsbad decrees and of the Count right. Congress of Vienna that had uh, put, you know, been established at the end of the Napoleonic Wars as a reaffirmation in 1815 in Europe of the uh, the, the necessity to to defend monarchical systems of order. Um, it may be worth making a point and really uh, accenting what you're saying right there. And just for people who don't know what the Congress of Vienna is, what things what things really look like when Poe is talking about developing uh, a, a high culture in the American Republic during his lifetime and the, the advent of the Congress of Vienna, which is 1814, 1815, right? Yep. Led by all this sort of oligarchical houses and interests of Europe, right? And so the, the, what was the state of art, the state of, 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 of uh, deliberation, right? Around profound and passion uh, conceptions respecting man and nature, as Shelley would say, it, around ideas of the beautiful. What did mm -hmm. that look like under uh, a Europe under the reign of the Congress of Vienna and yeah. the, the things like the Carlsbad decrees, you know, people need to know about that. Absolutely, uh, and and they don't realize that uh, the it was understood then um, that the arts were uh, the most dangerous of all things politically, um, which is why after the Congress of Vienna was established and the Holy Alliance was established with these different empires of Europe sort of cohering and, and agreeing to a new order, um, they needed to enforce that by the Carlsbad decrees, which in 1819, um, pretty much banned. It was a massive inquisitional book banning of all unacceptable ideas and thoughts of people like Schiller, like, you know, Thomas Paine, like Benjamin Franklin, like any, any um, philosopher, any musician. It was hard to listen to Beethoven um, at that, in those days. Um, and, I mean, Keats and Shelley both were very uh, sort of, uh, they were shunned in the literary oh, world. Oh yeah, they didn't get any, any they're, they did not make financial profit in their lifetime for most of what they were doing. I mean, Keats was attacked by all the literary magazines. He was totally shunned, you know, by a lot of the so-called, oh, yeah. you know, romantics and we're mm -hmm. saying was another romantic, but he was in complete, uh, they were in complete opposition to the kinds of poetic approach that Keats had. Yeah, uh, like and, and, yeah Lawrence right. Was, and you see, you see this in, in the Mask of Anarchy, right? Uh, Shelley's Mask of Anarchy, where he's directly calling out Prince Metternich um, and, uh, or is it Castlereagh? Anyway, he's directly con calling out the Congress of Vienna in that um, and the destruction that's waged um, as an effect and a consequence of, of this type of oligarchical uh, organization of society. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very much better understood then than it is today how uh, the arts... <laughs> and politics uh, were intertwined. So yeah, so that's the context in which Poe is really passionate about, and I, I hope you'll say yeah. something about it. He went on a lecture tour. He I wanted... will, yeah, yeah. And I, and I just want to read a, uh, a quote here because we're uh, at one point, 
uh, just to get across that Poe is self-aware of these two different opposing schools of the arts. I, I just pulled out a quote where um, he makes a point in 1933 when he's now returned from France, there's been uh, the subversion of Lafayette's attempt to create a second French revolution to establish a French Republic that failed in 1789 uh, um, that Lafayette first tried. So this now again is sabotaged. Um, thus, without France breaking free of empire, you know, Lafayette ended up uh, acquiescing to the idea of Charles the the tenth to become to be replaced by Philippe Galatier's son, um, and a new kingship was set up in France with some republican institutions, but that didn't last long. Um, so at the the dissolution of that that potential that Poe and many other artists, including James Fenimore Cooper, um, Samuel B. Morse, many others, were all in France at the time, organizing and helping to collaborate around that that dis with that destruction. The, the Polish resistance, the Republican movements there also failed. The followers of Kosciuszko uh, failed um, mm. and elsewhere. So there was a, um, a disappointment with that, but Poe ended up coming back and, and carrying out a, a new or creating a new field of battle um, in the literary world. And so in 18, 1833, he writes, when shall the artist assume his proper station in society? How long shall the various vermin of the earth who crawl around the altar of Mammon, the, the god of, of lucre, of, of money, who um, be more esteemed of men than they, the gifted ministers to those exalted uh, emotions which link us to the mysteries of heaven. To our own query, we may venture a reply. Not long. A spirit is already abroad at war with it. Getting across that the, you have these two, create, these two artistic movements, one tied to the love of money, um, and the other tied to something uh, higher, these the cultivation of these exalted emotions that link us to the heavens. Very, very much an opposing type of creativity and a creative movement. Right. And then a little bit later, he writes, we know, just to get across his, his understanding of, the, again, the, these two systems, we know the British to bear us little but ill will. We know that in the few insta instances in which our writers have been treated uh, with common decency in England, these writers have either openly paid homage to English institutions, which is hereditary institutions, or have lurking at bottom of their hearts a secret principle at war with democracy. Now, if we must have nationality, let it be a nationality that will throw off this yoke. So again, he's very clear in his, in his writings where he stands, what his ideal of art is. And you're like, again, how does this mesh with an understanding of the transcendental because in your, in his actual arts, in his, in his actual works, he very rarely just simply goes and expresses uh, this, this uh, divine character of the, the species. What he does is like I, I mentioned earlier here often, he often showcases where is it absent and what are the consequences of, of its absence in right. case studies that then become a domain of play. And it's very interesting to watch. And I think in his, his poems, uh, that you've written about extensively, I think you, you, we find the same sort of thing being ex examined again and again and again. Um, not always, but very often. The in absence sense, of the poem, there's more of a positive conception of that, what those higher agencies are, whereas in a lot of the short stories, it's more examples and profiles of what happens when that thing is absent. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is pretty interesting. There are different mediums and they allow for the exploration of, uh, of different, uh, the, the faculties in different ways. That's, I think that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that he, he's gone to war with a whole network at the time, um, <clears throat> if we look right. at um, people like uh, Thomas Carlyle, who, who headed the Edinburgh Review, Thomas Carlyle is, is known as sort of the, the, the founding father of the transcendentalist movement um, that spurned on an early supporter, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson who uh, Emerson actually described himself as a lieutenant of Carlisle when he stayed at Carlisle's house and also met with Bentham in right. Britain. And um, these were figures who were actually saying both in personal letters and essays, as well as it manifests in their, their poetic compositions. Um, but there, there's many quotes where they, they get across that their ideal of man is not a man that's integrated his individual, unique, sacred, uh, identity, his individuality with the welfare of a whole society. It's not that at all. It's the opposite. In their world, like um, 
Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle actually states in 1836 that there is in man something higher than love of happiness. And instead, that man must find, instead of happiness, blessedness. This is the everlasting yea, wherein all contradiction is resolved, wherein whoso walks and works, it is well with him. And him and Walt and uh, Emerson, I mean, what is he saying? He's basically saying that happiness is not, it's a false thing to, to aim for. The real thing we should aim for is just contentedness. And right. that's the ideal of the, of the healthy peasant who doesn't strive to make anything better, doesn't strive to change the unjust circumstances of their world. And right. Emerson also makes the case throughout his, his life that uh, before the Civil War, that it's not our duty to, uh, to defend a union or a nation. Every individual should just look out for themselves and walk their own personal path and let the, the union or the abstract nation that they're a part of dissolve if need be. They will, you know, true men, <laughs> true, true self-contained men who are actualized will just naturally create something new and better anyway. So don't fight uh, to save something like the Constitution. Um, Poe right. was always at war with these, these, these really abstract ideas, right? That, that, that's... Yeah, it doesn't, it's essentially doesn't exist. It's purely so they, direct they, they, experience. Hmm? Yeah. They're just laughing at anybody that believes in something more than just what they can touch, taste, hear, see, or smell. Right? Yeah. Anybody who's not selfish You're and not sense-based. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, and I think it's, it's important to appreciate because we are talking about poetry and I feel like a lot of people might be, you know, confused. Like you mentioned, you know, the danger of nuclear war at the beginning of the podcast, right. And all these different political intrigues, and I think people are going to be like, well, what does this have to do with poetry, right? Mm -hmm. but what we're saying right now is that there is a battle over ideas, right? Whether it's a war, whether it's all sorts of different political, uh, you know, intrigues and, and scandals, there's a battle over ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to look at the empire ultimately, yes, you want a population of individuals who cannot think in terms of justice, the pursuit of happiness, of any, cannot conceive of ideals mm -hmm. or fight for immaterial concepts or believe in immaterial context. Just go with what you can touch, taste, hear, see, or smell. Mm -hmm. But, and so it's interesting that we always, we hear about the romantic poets, right? And, but why were Wordsworth, Samuel Coleridge, Byron, these guys had, uh, you know, had a great reputation. They were so popular. You know, we're talking about the peasant mentality. And, and when you read the romantic works of Byron, Wordsworth, mm -hmm. or Coleridge, there's nothing really offensive if you want to have an imperial system. If you want to have a system where, you know, there's largely just, you know, uh, a feudal peasant system, you have a, you know, a higher class, which can appreciate, maybe has a higher taste. Mm -hmm. But th there's nothing that, in Wordsworth or Byron or Coleridge, that's really going to disturb that. In Shelley, in Keats, yes. And in Poe, ultimately, just like I was saying, that the empire really wants re to reduce people to just uh, what they can touch, taste, see, or, see, or smell. But when you read something like Poe, right, when you read even some of his early poems, there's something more, right? There's, there's definitely something there something uh, beyond, something in the distance, he says, right? There's something beyond what you can touch, taste, hear, see, or smell. And he's stir he's, he's arousing that within us, mm -hmm. within his reader, and they can't really deny it, mm -hmm. even if they can't put it into words. And this is often the case that, I mean, I think uh, our, our language has greatly suffered and to the degree that we are not uh, informed by great poetry, we can often lack the kind of uh, language, lexicon, uh, to, to speak about higher ideas, higher poetic concepts mm -hmm. in the way that someone like Poe uh, was able to defend or in the way that someone like Shelley was able to defend. And mm -hmm. in the way that ultimately those same kinds of a quality of poetic ideas is what you found in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's what really pissed off the empire. You know, you spoke of Bentham, Carlyle, uh, you know, the, this whole network also around Lord Shelburne, right? That these guys really wanted to destroy the idea 
of a republic. And Bentham actually uh, came out attacking the Declaration of Independence, specifically life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because they were imprescriptible rights. Yeah. Right. There was no concrete yeah. sort of well, how do you decide who has, you know, what is life, liberty? There was no sort of objective metric, right. i.e. something sensual by which you could measure it against. And if you can't measure it against some material or sensual standard, you can't, it's, it's considered immeasurable. Yeah. But Poe develops in his Eureka, mm -hmm. in his, ultimately the, the, the essence of his poetry is defining something that, no, you are able to measure uh, mm -hmm. higher concepts. They're incommensurable yeah. with objects of sense, but just because you cannot measure them uh, against something sense perceptual, it doesn't mean that they're not attainable through what Poe is really talking about as the poetic sentiment, right? Do you, do you want to talk about Eureka a bit? A certain mood. Uh, yeah, sure. You know what? I mean, I, I feel like we could go on with the... Pose, I would encourage everybody, let's do it this way. Uh, we're going to link to your presentation on the historical okay. uh, personality of Edgar Allan Poe, his connections to the intelligent networks uh, around the American Revolution. And just by people watching that, you just have to ask yourself, why don't, there's so much fascination around Poe. How come none of the scholars, why doesn't anybody talk about this? Yeah. You know, why, why are we 200 years later? And it's only really now that, uh, I mean, I think in your presentation, you, you bring it together in a way that I've never seen done before. And you, you mentioned some of the people uh, whose work you use, but uh, I will, I really recommend to all our listeners to go listen to uh, Matthew's class on the Edgar Allan Poe you never yeah. knew. We're going to link to it at the bottom. So and we'll also link into uh, the, the thing that, that got a lot of those ideas um, that, that helped put me on that path um, was the pioneering work of Alan Salisbury, um, who just right. published some just incredible research uh, back in the 70s and 80s on this. And uh, we can link in that. I guess you can link that in the description too to his works. Yeah. So we're going to make all that available. And uh, so, yeah, that'll allow us to just go on uh, to, yeah, this question of Eureka. So we're talking about these, you know, these higher concepts, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Poe talks about this supernal loveliness, right? And the, the poetic mood, mm -hmm. uh, the poetic sentiment, yep. which is not just in poetry. I think uh, uh, just to disabuse anybody from the idea, we're somehow talking about something that is particular to a written text or to, you know, a spoken word. No, you find it in painting, you find it in, and Poe says this, you find it in architecture, you find it in even the curious case of the uh, landscape garden, as mm. Poe points out. And most right. especially you find it in music. Yeah. And music has no words, right? If we're talking about, you know, a Beethoven composition, a Beethoven symphony, but it's just as palpable. It's actually more palpable, mm. Poe says, in music than it is in poetry. So, you know, this poetic sentiment this, there's a universal, it has a universal characteristic. And yeah. so in Eureka, he is writing a prose poem, which turns to the question of science. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. But it's interesting to see that the terms and the kind of lexicon that he uses to describe poetry, it's very closely related when he starts to take up the subject of science mm -hmm. and I mean, I'll let you talk about it, but he, he makes some crucial points by exposing the fallacy of the sort of traditional uh, idea of scientific thinking. And yeah. that, that was intentionally imposed on people. That was intentionally imposed yeah. into the education system right. to make people stupid. Yeah. Pardon my French. Yeah, but yeah. ultimately, any, if, you're, if, put, if we put ourselves in the role of an oligarch, or some sort of imperial manager. If you're smart at all, you understand that we do need to keep people stupid. We can't I, really allow for a discussion <laughs> of higher ideals. Yeah. Like that's, that's I, I, lo I love the fact that you're just saying that. Uh, no, no, because that that's bold to say that, and it's true. Um, that that because it's a it's a paradox. It seems like how can you educate people to be dumb? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Once you're educated, you're not dumb anymore. But right. 
and this this is this is the 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 smoke and mirrors game um, that we've all had to every generation we've we've had to to struggle with this. Some right. generations have been able to to understand it and navigate through it better than others. Poe definitely understood it and navigated through it through through it very effectively and gave us in especially the uh, the the Eureka essay you just mentioned. The the gave every generation the best tools to help navigate that that um, foggy water, um, yeah. because he zeroes in in this essay on the figures of John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham. Um, directly, he's directly calling them out and getting at the point that it's the the there's two modes of thinking that are both false modes that keep us from the the right path that gets us to Eureka's. That's the, that's why he calls the whole thing. Eureka. Uh, a Eureka, what is that? I mean, this is a word that, um, who was it? Um, Archimedes had, uh, you know, back 2000 years ago or more when he discovered uh, a way to measure the density of, of gold um, when he was sitting in a bathtub. And, and, and so he, that was the Greek word for, I, I think I got it or something. I'm not even too sure. But anyway, that, that's so it, it, it's a word that was created and popularized and, and it's associated with that, that aha I didn't know something. Now I know it. There is that in-betweenness and it's that moment in between go- being in a state of ignorance to being in a state of knowledge. That's the Eureka sort of metaphor. Um, so what are the two paths he says that, that derail us that seem like knowledge? And he's, he, yeah. he calls one creeping and the other crawling. One is the path of deductive thinking. The other is the path of inductive thinking. We're mm-hmm. told that these two modes of logic, one which rose, arose as he says in his essay, uh, from the thinking of Aristotle that he calls Aries total and the other from uh, Francis Bacon who really popularized the opposing mode that he calls the hog, Bacon, hog, um, later on. Um, one is otherwise known as a priori thinking, the, the mode of Aristotle, of induction. The other is a posteriori thinking, the mode of deduction. Um, a, po- a priori is where you start with rules that you cannot verify if they're true, but you have to start with certain rules. Um, and then those rules allow your, they allow you to navigate through the world of phenomenon with your senses that you then take sensory data of whether it's the positions of the planets or whether it's the growth of, of plant life or whatever, you just plug in the data you're measuring or weighing into uh, categories of experience that are shaped by those rules that you assume abstractly are true that then allows you to judge meaning value and whatever else that nav- that you decide if you're, you know, let's say uh, a scientist, yeah. a biologist or a political well, philosopher. Huh? For example, I mean, for example, in, in a, a perfect Aristotelian example, the universe is perfect. Right. And perfection is that which uh, doesn't need any more improvement. So yeah. a universe that is perfect is going to be a universe that number one, doesn't change. Right. Because if it's changing, that it's means perfect. you're getting yeah. worse or, better and that's not perfect so you know from that well what is the most perfect of uh, shapes circle you know movements are circular movements they're the most even so planets have to move in circles right exactly and also, these are all a priori assumptions exactly exactly sort of yeah. coming up in our head and then we'll say well the universe it has to be this way because yeah. xyz yeah, exactly and Exactly. And if you believe in that, then you're, you're forever going to be incapable of discovering the true elliptical nature of planets, if you believe in that, to the degree that you hold on to that. Um, <clears throat> the reality is Aristotle never discovered anything with that method. That's important to think about. People, he's famous for his philosophy, but people say, oh yeah, but he was wrong and everything's scientific. Yeah, well, that's a big deal. Um, so the opposing view of Bacon um, that came up much later um, yeah. in, the, in the 1600s, popularized was that popularized and, and this this basically asserted no it's the opposite case um what we have to do is a, a we have to have a posteriori so we we start with our sensory data we look for patterns that might arise in our sensory data and if when we find those patterns right from the five senses then we can extrapolate a universal generality a law that we assume thus exist as a linear extrapolation from those patterns of the senses now that you know, both of them can be used. And Poe makes the point that they're both useful. You don't want to just cut one off and not do the other, but you can't limit yourself to either one or any combination of the two without something additional. And if you try to do that, 
then you will not only cut off your creative reason, your ability to make those types of leaps that are trend that are nonlinear transcendental leaps into the right. unknown uh, discovery pro principle that you're looking for, but politically, economically, you will result in the same paradoxes that people like uh, John Stuart Mill or Bentham or any of the British um, um, establishment. Utilitarian. Uh... Yeah, the, the, those, those empiricist economists will tend to find themselves in the same uh, Malthusian paradox of overpopulation, that you're, you're always going to fall under a problem over time where your population will exceed your, your capacity to sustain that very population, resulting in w necessary wars over the scarcity of resources, mass starvation over the lack of ability to sustain, yada, yada. And it right. becomes a bit of a Pygmalion effect, right? Because an empire can't tolerate creative thought because that, that creates conditions where individuals emerge like a Benjamin Franklin, not from the hereditary class, but from the poor who then yeah. understand how to think critically and insightfully about the future and about human nature. And then they, God forbid, communicate that to others or inspire others. That's intolerable. But at the same time, you can't overcome the population uh, catastrophe. And so their solution is population control and things like the Carlsbad decrees and the Congress of Vienna was a good example of one form of that, uh, that we touched upon earlier. So, um, Pose Eureka. I mean, again, this is, you got to look at it in context because people, this is often when you look, when you buy a compiled uh, works of, of Poe, very, very infrequently does it include this last piece that Poe considered the greatest, most important piece of work in his lifetime. Right. Um, it rarely includes that. You can find it online. But when you actually look at what was Poe doing when he died his mysterious death in 1849, he was in the midst of doing a nationwide lecture tour um, under the theme of the cosmogony of the universe. Very bold. And he was doing this to raise money, subscription funds, for a new magazine that he was going to set up called The Stylus. It was actually you who put me onto this uh, yeah. last year. Um, and it's fascinating when you actually look at his writings, his works about his intention for The Stylus. There's drawings. His, you know, He did thumbnail sketches of what the cover would look like, what, what it would be involved in it. And for the first time, he would not be an editor for somebody else's magazine, like the Southern Literary Men Messenger or something like that, or Graham's Magazine, but right. rather he would be the, the controller of the entire epistemology of a magazine for the first time. And so he was en route back from Virginia, where he was conducting uh, his last lectures, um, going through the nature of mind, its, its parallels with and, and harmonies with the nature of God's mind, of the, the, the mind that created the laws of the universe. Very, very bold uh, thesis. Mm -hmm. and he's on his route back with money in hand to, to New York to set up his, his magazine that he said would be the most important endeavor of his life unless he died before it was accomplished. But he said, certainly if I don't die before it's accomplished, this will be the most important thing I will have, have ever done and I will do it. Um, and that's, that's me almost directly paraphrasing. Like that's exactly what he says. Um, however, he dies en route. I think he's in Baltimore or something when he's, he's, right. he's en route back to New York and, you know, he's discovered one, you know, uh, basically drugged up wearing somebody else's clothes in the back alley of some place and brought into a hospital, cut off from all of his friends, family. Nobody's allowed to see him. He's, he's held up there for several days where he dies. Um, and uh, if, so you actually look at what is he doing? These lectures and this uh, essay is what he calls the manifesto for his magazine. And that magazine is designed to unite um, analyses of fine arts, of poetry, of literature, and of political history, all in one unifying field, one unifying package. Mm -hmm. um, really an important concept. And this is sort of what Ben Franklin was doing earlier with the Poor Richard's Almanac or, or Schiller was doing with the Thalia magazine. But you know, all of these great uh, uh, cultural warriors they are all in the midst of, of doing things like this to upgrade the quality of the culture as a whole so that people can be prepared for the types of political battles and insights that they need to have. Now, insight is an important thing because it's what is insight? Is it where do you define it deductively or inductively? It's more than the two. It's something that, you know, you have a sense of the essence of something's being. That's insight. Um, 
and you can you you it's not you, sense perceptual it's I not think sense perceptual no so it's a sight of what i people I, I i think it's important to uh sort of appreciate the idea that we're talking about sight of something that you cannot see or experience with your senses mm -hmm. that's a very upsetting concept for most people for yeah. a lot of people uh or i shouldn't maybe i shouldn't say most people i say people who have gone through the traditional standard education system, not just of today or the last 10 years, yeah. but really for, for many decades now, um, they're very uncomfortable dealing with these kinds of metaphysical concepts. In fact, it, it just, it's treated as its own obscure uh, category, when in fact, for all these great geniuses, whether it's Poe, whether it's Mozart, whether it's yeah. Dante, uh, Shakespeare, you know, this is what they're really concerned with, yep. insight, right? How do we create, how do we generate insight, artistic insight? Because yeah. it's, it's really, it's, it's seeing with understanding. So you're not seeing with your eyes, you're seeing with your mind's eye, you're seeing through your understanding of a process. And that's also where the domain of a higher level of play, playfulness can arise. So you right. can have like the improvs of a, of a Bach, you know, composing these incredible uh, royal themes, you know, and right. uh, his, his, uh, entire well-tempering system that came out of his investing and his fugues came out of this playfulness and and people are are, are awe-inspired like how does somebody improvise something like that mm -hmm. and uh and it comes through work through an understanding of technique of course you need these things but at a certain point if you're doing it with a proper honest spirit you come to a deeper penetration of the principles that organize what you're playing with and then you could play with them and you can yeah. discover things and combinations and dissonances and how dissonances can combine with harmonies that have a certain effect in some way that makes people who also are exposed to your, your art uh, better in some way, right? It doesn't mean that you make them better people in like, uh, I've made a robot, but you enhance their, their ability to um, harmonize their inner self with their higher self. Right, their their physical self, their fleshly self, with their higher spiritual divine self, and access those universal emotions, these that connect us with the divine that that Poe talks about. And I would just like to say two things, giving two examples. Um, right. I, I thought was was just great in Poe's works um, that deal that that do this in a in a very direct way. And the one you have is his short story, Descent of the Maelstrom. And in the Descent into the Maelstrom. It's a wonderful example of this where he just, he doesn't talk about it. He just does it. And what do you have is like these two brothers um, who are actually, I think there's a third brother, but they're at sea in a fishing boat. And all of a sudden they're caught in a maelstrom, a big giant vortex opens up in the, in the sea and it's pulling everything in. And it's a slow, scary process of circling down into the center of this hole in the, in the, in the whirlpool that's just eating up everything going in. And there's a contrast between the, the, uh, states of, of insight and spiritual disposition of the two brothers, where one brother just totally loses his shit and is right. dominated by the fear of this immense, hostile, sense-perceptive storm and environment. And he loses his shit to the point that he pushes his other brother who's holding on to a, a stable hook in the middle of the boat for to be stationary. I think one brother at this point just already got, you know, he's holding on to a pole and got pulled in. He already got blown off and was killed. So there's two brothers now. The one pushes the other brother off. Now the other brother is like loosely flailing around the boat. And this now brother almost kills his other brother, right? Because he's, he's losing his stuff. Right, right, and I remember the story. Yeah, go on. Yeah. And the other brother is different. He actually is maintaining control of his mind. And he's, he's observing what's going on. And he actually takes the time to recognize that, that the heavier um, trees and everything else in the whirlpool with their boat is being sucked down faster and faster into the center. But he sees that some of the, the lighter driftwood that's also circling only circles down, but then circles back up again. And he tries to communicate this to his other freaking out brother. And the other brother can't hear anything, just pushes him away again, almost kills him again. And he's like, well, I can't, you know, I can't interact with him anymore. And he just jumps off the boat and holds on to a, a barrel or a very light piece of wood. And as, as he is not going down into the center, he's constantly just at a stationary circling position. He's watching his other brother who's holding on for dear life and freaking out, collapse into the center and die. So he's, he has that eureka moment because he's able to maintain his composure and his inner uh, soul is able to not be moved 
uh, irreparably by the, the storms and turmoil about him. The other, and so that's the thing, that's the insight, right? <clears throat> There's two fundamentally different kinds of thinking is what Poe's really demonstrating. The one person, uh, the other brother, he has, he has just, and we can all understand it, he has a primal reaction. Yeah. His primal instincts, his survival instincts, fight or flight, Really, it's, it's the most primal. I mean, it's not uh, very developed, but it's also, in a sense, the most uh, ingrained, right? Yes. Because it happens at such an automatic level. But the point is that this person isn't really able to think beyond those sort of automatic uh, impulses that just kick in because you are in danger. Exactly. And I mean, if, you, if you're trying to run, again, I, I like if, if you're a, a rich, you know, evil oligarch or an imperialist, you want people to maintain that kind of sort of just brutish, primal sense of identity where it's like, well, he had no choice. You know, he was going to die if he didn't do something. So, yeah, I guess I I would have to let my brother die as well. You know, and always these kind of closed system, you know, binary choices. Uh, you know, you either act like a brute and survive or you try and be virtuous and uh, you die. You know, it's very fun to be there's this whole idea of just laughing at people who have some higher sense yeah, yeah. of awfulness, right? Yeah. Like you're dead because you believe in these farcical ideas. Look how stupid you are for not acting like a primal brute, like yeah. a pig that's about to be. And stopped. ironically, right, the second you, you, you start focusing on your own personal self-interest and you're, you know, <clears throat> and, and you're, you live in this fight or flight, a survival mode, you're less equipped to actually survive yeah, in a way can't. only a human could. Yeah, right. and so the other guy actually discovers what we could call a human uh, quality of reasoning. Yeah, which is actually what allows him to get out of the crisis. And I mean, exactly. how is that not relevant to the kind of political situation that uh, we've seen throughout history that we see today? Yes, Do we want people reacting with this kind of brutish, uh, you know, sort of uh, primal mindset or do we want people to actually make a leap uh to have a, a, a eureka moment right mm -hmm. in how they view the world and this is what becomes insight mm -hmm. right all of a sudden things appear differently yes because there's, a, there's an insight into a higher exactly possibility exactly now i got a quick question for you how long do you have for this podcast because i, I i've got a couple of eureka punchlines I, I want people to experience but i don't want to go on too long either so what how uh, i mean where am i going welcome to lockdown world we're <laughs> having fun we're talking about important matters okay and, uh, yeah so i go on and i think uh i can read a poem one of the poems that i want to read at the end to sort of culminate what okay. you're going to show with eureka and how this sort of beautifully just naturally unfolds in okay even if all right all right let's do that let's do that so okay um <clears throat> so i won't i won't go with the second case study but people should read uh inspector dupin's stories or the stories of inspector dupin and especially the purloined letter uh to get another example of this seeing with insight and what um you know inspector dupin says at one point when he was able to discover what no one else was able to discover and and his assistant is like how are you doing this and he said, well, I knew the nature of the person I, who, who conducted this crime. And if he right. was a mathematician, I know that he couldn't have reasoned well at all. And if he was just a poet, he couldn't have also reasoned very well. And in both cases, he would have been uh, susceptible. His crime would have been discovered by those police officers who are using this deductive and inductive mode of, of rigorous logic, but it's not right. getting them anywhere. He's like, but I know that he studied the infinitesimal calculus and he was a poet. And because of that, I knew how he thought. And because of that, I was able to do what they were not able to do. And so people want to get the answer to that. They got to read the Purloined Letter, which they should do after this, this podcast. However, we're talking about Eureka. So in the Eureka, after he gets at the, the fallacies of these two methods of thinking, creeping and crawling, he says that the, the key thing here is that you're imposing these onto a, 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 a species of man that whose, whose true nature wants nothing more than to soar. And, and he gives us a case study of, of a successful example of this type of soaring beyond the two modes of reasoning 
the case of Kepler directly. He talks about Kepler in his book right. um, and how Kepler used a form of intuitive leap. He calls it a guess, but it's really more than that. And he, he talks about that into the harmonies, the musicality of the space-time of the universe that organized the positions of the orbits around um, the sun as a central moving force in elliptical positions, right? right? Kepler's discovery, his third law emanates from his ability to discover that the, the ratio of the, um, the aphelion and perihelion, the, the closest and furthest positions of planets from the sun and the speed at which they're moving at the slowest and fastest moments have a certain relationship, all planets together have a certain harmonic relationship mm. of, uh, of cubic uh, mean distances to the square of the periodicities. And yeah. that is what allowed Kepler that, that leap in to discover his third law. And so Poe zeroes in on this Keplerian approach, which is very different from these two opposing schools of uh, Aristotle and, and, uh, and Bacon, which manifested in the world of, of Leibniz versus um, Newton earlier on. Um, Newton, who's, who, you know, there's a lot of evidence to, to showcase that Newton really stole a lot of the discoveries he's famous for from people like the, like the calculus, from people who were Keplerian platonic thinkers like, like uh, um, uh, Leibniz, yeah. who also comes up in Poe's essay. And so Poe says, okay, if we have to think, if we are made in the image of the creator, then we have to understand how poetry and uh, science work together. And he just, he opens up in his preface saying, I offer this book of truths. This is Poe saying, I offer this book of truths, not in, the, in its character of truth teller, but for the beauty that abounds in its truth, constituting it true. To these, I present the composition as an art product alone, let us say as a romance, or if I, not, uh, if I be not urging too lofty a claim as a poem, what I hear propound is true, therefore it cannot die. Or if by any means it be now trodden down so that it die, it will rise to the, to the life everlasting again. Nevertheless, it is as a poem only that I wish for this work to be judged after I am dead. Sure. And so in the course of this amazing, exquisite development, and, and sure, in hindsight, you could say scientifically in the facts, there might be some fallacies that he didn't know about in 1848, 49, when he was writing this. But yeah. the method of thinking is very much in, ingrained in the in things that we've seen from like Plato's Timaeus, um, investigating the method of investigating the mind of the universe, right? And it's similarity to the mind of uh, an integrated human being who's able to look at the relationships of platonic solids and how they relate to the formation of elements, planets, orbits, whatever. So he's going through, he's like, well, we need um, to discover like, what are the laws of the universe? And he uh, cites um, this wonderful, paradoxical, ironic quality um, that people like Cusa and he cites Blaise Pascal, who plays with this idea, um, <clears throat> uh, zeroed in on, of a, of a universe, he says, which is likened metaphorically to a sphere of which its center is everywhere, the circumference nowhere. And he's like, but this definition is no definition of the stars we see but we may accept it still with some mental reservation as a definition rigorous enough for all practical purposes of the universe proper. That is to say of the universe of space, the latter then let us regard as a sphere of which the center is everywhere, the circumference nowhere. That right there is a, is a wonderful self-contradictory idea, but it's so poetic because it's like the idea of putting your, no matter where you would position yourself as an observer in the universe, he's saying, mm -hmm. looking out in all 360 degrees around you, it would still appear as though you're in the center of the universe, which is the development again by Pascal, earlier by Cusa, earlier by Kepler. Um, and so there's a boundedness by the idea sphere, which has, you know, a bounded quality to it, but at the same time, an idea of unboundedness coexisting, in, in, right, with that idea. Right. And with that, he also takes us through other um, seemingly opposing ideas that coexist, like the one and the infinite and the many, which is, again, treated by all of these, these great thinkers um, in history, where he, he starts you off as an observer on a, on a mountaintop, saying, imagine that you're on the mountaintop looking around at the world around you. And it seems like you're one person, but there's all of these infinitely diverse things to look at around you, but start yeah. spinning and spin faster and spin faster and spin faster. And he, he's like, at a certain point, all of the many, the infinite 
become increasingly a one as you're spinning at this infinite speed around you. Mm. It's like now ex extrapolate that, extrapolate that. And so he, he's taking you through these vicarious uh, devices. Um, they're thought experiments. These thought experiments, exactly. That open up new uh, thought concepts that you wouldn't have had otherwise that allow you to unite the one and the many, the infinite and the finite. And, he, and it's through a bunch of wonderful jumping backs and back and forths and these types of, of uh, poetic images that he allows your mind to then create a new mental ecosystem in which certain concepts of God that couldn't have existed before can now arise. Yeah, and I, I have a the, quote on yeah. the internet. I, do you have that one that let us begin then at once? No. That, can I, yeah, I, I, based on what you're saying, uh, this is from Eureka. He says, let us begin then at once with that merest of words, infinity. This like God, spirit, and some other expressions of which the equivalents exist in all languages is by no means the expression of an idea but of an effort at one, it stands for the possible attempt at an impossible conception. Man needed a term by which to point out the direction of this effort, the cloud behind which lay forever invisible the object of this attempt. A word in fine was demanded by means of which one human being might put himself in relation at once with another human being and with a certain tendency of the human intellect out of this demand arose the word infinity which is thus the representative but of the thought of a thought mm. lovely lovely yes that's exactly oh that, that really um that's a wonderful quote <clears throat> and yeah the the thought of a thought thinking about thinking um is really the key to get at this this idea of a platonic higher hypothesis Right, which which right. people who are going to be enslaved or manipulatable, they they are out of touch with the part of their identity that's associated with the 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 the, the thinking side of themselves, and they don't know how to think about thinking itself. Yeah, and look back on on that, which he does, and he gets at the yearning too. Right, that what's more important than than uh, the the simple uh, fixed set of relationships of things that exist in some ephemeral now, right? He's like, yeah. what's more important and more fundamental is the yearning for becoming more than what is now. The yearning for this transcendental thing that's always outside of the fixed realm of being in any given moment. And I think also later on, he talks about the idea of God's mind as being more than simply the, the laws of nature. Because it's the, it's the, the thing that creates the unifying simple substance that gives meaning and infuses order and purpose to the, the manifold laws of creation as being more than simply the sequence of time. It's being, and he, right. he describes the simultaneity of all eternity when you start thinking in those higher uh, terms of God's mind, which exists right. in all past, all future, everything. And um, I thought that the parting yeah. thought that he sort of, I, I, it's really great to just leave us on, on this point before uh, transitioning, I believe, unless you wanna talk about this a bit more, is this wonderful quote at the end well, hang on, just to add on, based on what you said, mm -hmm. uh, because you talked about this yearning. And I mean, this idea of yearning comes back in the discussion of poetry, but the way you're talking about it, you're talking about it more from a scientific standpoint. And I feel like some people might hear that and be like, well, that, no, you're supposed to be dispassionate. You're supposed to be mm -hmm. sort of objective. But if you don't have a yearning for something beyond you, yeah. right? If you're just, uh, you know, a plebeian sort of, peasant minded person uh that i have nothing against peasants that's not what i'm trying to say that not to but if you're if your desires are essentially limited to only what's within your immediate uh domain of experience mm -hmm. how are you ever going to discover something new the whole idea of science right is that you're going beyond what is within the realm of the known yeah. which in sense perceptual terms, because within your locality, within your neighborhood, your family, your friends, you know, all these good things. But if you really want to have a society that sees fundamental changes, leaps in knowledge, a society driven by Eurekas, you know, there has to be that yearning. There is no proper scientific method 
if you don't, if we don't have a society that has a thirst yeah. for learning for something, what Poe says is in the distance. Yeah. And maybe I, I think this is a good time to just throw in this quote and then we continue. Okay. Cause I got a quote, I got a quote to end, but if you got a quote, okay, okay go for it. You go, okay. You go with it. <laughs> All right, because I think that this quote really is just such a nice unifying re yeah. resolution to the, he knows that he's building up paradoxes in your mind. He knows that throughout the entire long essay. But, yeah. and I'm not saying this, I don't, this is not to, I'm not doing this to try to like screw up the, the punchline for people, but it's really to inspire them to actually read it through and activate yeah. this in their own mind by reading the essay. It but regardless. So huh? it takes work regardless. Even if you give us an answer, it means nothing unless we really- nothing. Exactly. Have found way to know whether it's true or not yes and so dealing now with the with poetry art and science um he says here it is the poetical essence of the universe of the universe which in the supremeness of symmetry is but the most sublime of poems now symmetry and consistency are convertible terms thus poetry and truth are one think mm. You know, think the uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn, right? Truth is beauty, beauty is, beauty is truth. Um, a, a thing is consistent in the ratio of its truth, true in the ratio of its consistency. A perfect consistency, I repeat, can be nothing but an absolute truth. We may take it for granted then that man cannot long or widely err if he suffer himself to be guided by his poetical, which I have maintained to be his truthful in being his symmetrical instinct. He must have a care, however, lest in pursuing too heedlessly the superficial symmetry of forms and motion, that is the physical symmetries that our senses can pick up, which is superficial, he leaves out of sight the really essential symmetry of the principles which determine and control them. So there, even though he's saying like there, this whole absolute truth, this perfect symmetry, this is something which we can never fully attain but we're always yearning more for, towards to becoming more in harmony with like tuning ourselves without ever being able to reach that to be in more to be in an ever more perfect union with the universe exactly exactly yes yeah so it redefines like what the the more perfect union uh principle what what was it that the founding fathers ben, benjamin franklin who uh constructed that more towards a more perfect union idea that was the base of the constitutional preamble um, it's and, and, and the Declaration of Independence. Hmm? It's a symmetry of thought, right, that Poe is describing here. It's not a symmetry of material things. No, exactly. Among immaterial things. And a symmetry b between the, um, the harmony of our soul, which has different aspects to it you know, of the, of the, the rational side, the feeling side, the passions that unite the both. And he's talking about the harmonization of all of these components together as a symmetry. That's, that's what he's developing. Right. And I mean, yeah, the, I, you know, we're, uh, we're every time we're throwing around the word soul, right? Okay. I, I, I feel like people are you can hear that there's people have so many ideas about this, but I think we have to take it in context of, or take it in context of what I was saying, not in, you know, I think people have all these ideas of like fossilized or formalized religions or, or dogmatic forms uh, uh, or approaches to something like the question of the soul. But if the idea is Poe is approaching something immaterial, there is this immaterial yearning and there's a way to investigate its immaterial characteristics. And the idea of symmetry, right? A symmetry of thoughts uh, is very interesting and in that we're trying to discover a symmetry in the universe, which we are trying to bring ourselves in ever more perfect uh, harmony with, right? The more we discover about the universe, the more the human species is able to sort of adapt its behavior, to change its behavior uh, in recognizing these higher laws. You know, I mean, maybe riding bikes causes cancer, so we're not going to ride bikes anymore. But I, that's a crazy example. But you know what I mean? The more we discover about how galaxies form or, you know, many of the paradoxes that exist around, you know, whether fusion, right, the nature of light, when we make fundamental breakthroughs on these things, it will change the way our society organizes itself. And so there's a symmetry of idea there. All that to say that all these things that we're talking about that can be seen as 
material sort of developments within the, the bounds of the finite world, they're ultimately only possible because there is this higher symmetry of ideas that is being uh, discovered, the symmetry between our thoughts and how the universe actually functions. Yeah. Right. And so that's what truth is all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I think this conception is indispensable for, you know, I mean, in poetry, it often comes naturally, right? In the arts, the poet isn't necessarily going to consciously think everything we've just described, but they are going to respond to that uh, innate yearning. In a sense, art is like a, it's a special kind of science, right? Or it's a more sort of primal or instinctual science, which deals more with that immediate yearning within and to capture something beyond. Whereas in science, it becomes directed at the actual external universe and trying to sort of understand how using this longing to make sense of things outside us. Right. Well, I, I always enjoyed this, this uh, definition uh, by the, the late uh, philosopher, Lyndon LaRouche, who, um, so his writings, I mean, some of the, there's some really profound epistemological concepts in, in, in his writings and on, on the issue of art and science. Um, I, I like the, the definition that of science as being the study of, of mankind coming to better and better know uh, the universe um, ever more perfectly and arts being the uh, domain of mankind coming to ever, never better, more understand the universe of his own nature. So our own internal universe, which we call the subjective, but it, it has certain laws, certain principles that organize it, that we can study and perfect right. as, as we understand it, we can willfully improve those uh, inner harmonies of that inner universe. And then we find a corollary in our power to accelerate our understanding to the invisible structures organizing the external so-called objective universe. And there's a reciprocity, right, of the objective and subjective that always uh, dynamically play on each other. The finite and the infinite. The finite and the infinite, right. Like we are being the microcosm of the macrocosm, that we are the condensed expression of the willful self-organized uh, part of the universe that can willfully organize in a, in a sort of uh, uh, direction, directioned way willfully, whereas everything else in the universe, whether it's the biosphere, uh, you know, other living matter, uh, the physical matter of chemistry in uh, around, you know, stars, star formation, galaxy formation, that's not animated by cognitive, um, cognitive human creative components. Um, they, they're organized without the free will component. They're, they're organized according to those laws. They have certain rhythms, repetitions, harmonies, but they don't self-reflect and change willfully their behavior according to anything external to themselves. Right. Um, so that's purely human beings and, and that's very special. It's very lawful and it doesn't make, it does, it does have certain ramifications on how we choose to organize economically, politically, our society in accordance to what standards, right? And are right. they in harmony with an imperial uh, system of logic of Hobbes or, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Mackinder, the founder of modern geopolitics, uh, geopolitics, who's right. you know, shaped people's thinking on both the left and the right side of the spectrum doesn't it, how, how in harmony with their thinking is that. And well, we'll find that generally it's much more in harmony with a, a very different mode, which is more in, in alignment with how Benjamin Franklin was thinking about international law or, or Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Delano Roosevelt or John F. Kennedy, who all had a very different paradigm, a different conception of the self-interest of each nation and each part of each nation with a whole much more in harmony with those discoverable laws of nature. Well, I mean, it's interesting to think because yeah, going back to this idea of uh, imperialism, the denial of immaterial ideas, of universal yeah. principles, right? Yeah. That justice isn't just a construct, but that it's actually something that has to be respected by the human species in the universe. And when there is not justice, bad things happen, you know? And I mean, it, it, it helps. There are different scales at which we can look at that. I mean, Poe has fun looking at uh, what happens to psychos or people with really bad sort of internal uh, obsession. And when they're not able to sort of uh, break out of that kind of logic, the logic of their obsessive behaviors, uh, it leads to all sorts of crazy things. 
right? But you can also talk about it in terms of empires and the way the empires reduce entire populations. Uh, they reduce them to basically serfs and slaves, right? And how that ultimately leads to the empire's own demise. And usually a lot of murder, right? Because you, you, you can't really control things anymore. Everything's spinning out of control. And the only way to try and bring back order to this total uh, chaos that the mayhem that you've sort of been sowing for years, uh, I mean, ultimately you can't, it, it, it sort of uh, all unravels. Yeah. And well, your idea of your idea of peace in that in that thought matrix is a piece of the grave, as Kennedy said, right? Not the positive peace that we want to cultivate of a positive principle of, of mutual self interest in a harmony of interests of a, a, a global family, right? United with common universal characteristics and desires that bring us together and allow us to transcend our differences. Um, that doesn't exist in the mind of somebody who thinks the way your your oligarch thinks. For them, yeah. peace is really an absence of action. Right. Yeah. And there's no right. And there, all that to say so that, yeah, in the imperial mindset, they, they we got done away with beauty, justice, uh, you know, the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty. And you just see that you see what happens when you get rid of these concepts. Uh, ultimately, it's uh, everything breaks down. It's, it's yeah. about you, people. I, I think a lot of the in terms of literature with the, the modernist movement, you know what? It took a hundred years for everything to break down, but it has broken down, right? People just wanted to focus on the text. They wanted to just obsess and idolize language. Uh, you know, Odin said, uh, poetry does nothing, right? And so it's just about the, 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 the direct text and the experiences uh, that, you know, are, are, are generated as literary effects. But if you project that out, over time, right? By sort of rejecting any sort of higher idea, you're gonna to have to leave soon, I guess. No, no, I just uh, saw my, my computer's about to die. That's why. Oh, okay. Um, Finish your thought and then I'm gonna run and get my, my plug. Yeah, you're, anything goes, right? At the, at, if you get rid of those concepts, then basically everything the empire does is okay. You know, but you could say it's mean, but if it's not actually, if there's no justice, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so, just sucks for the people that it's happening to, mm -hmm. but who cares? Exactly. Right. So yeah, exactly. We need a higher. Hold that thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All good. All right. So sorry. I, feel like I had, uh, I, I, I feel like I had, uh, I felt like I was, had some thought that I wanted to express which is why I was saying what I was saying. But um, yeah, I, I, I kind of lost that thought, which is fine. All right. But um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we're back to, we're gonna do like the modern we're at year zero now. So we're, we're starting <laughs> to rediscover everything. Um, I would recommend to everybody to go watch Matthew's class on the real Edgar Allan Poe, who he actually was, who his, uh, his, his uh, connections within the intelligence circles that were fighting to keep the, Amer the ideas of the American Republic alive, right? And how Poe was really the vanguard of trying to basically set up the kind of artistic culture that could generate the kinds of artistic insights uh, which are necessary to fight for these higher kinds of political ideals. And how, yeah, ultimately, this is what I wanted to say in whichever way before, that the imperial subversion of that is what makes possible sort of poo-pooing, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And ultimately saying that, you know, there are slaves, there are masters, like you can't prove that wrong without a conception of justice. You can't, you can say you don't like it. You can say it's mean, but guess what? The mean people are going to crush and enslave you and your children. So at a certain point, you need a longing. You need a, a, a yearning that's going to say, well, you might even have to die for this, but you're recognizing that you are responding to something that's higher and you sort of recognize that. Yeah. But you need a poetic faculty. Ultimately, that's what a poetic faculty is. If you don't have a poetic 
uh, faculty, you can't really recognize these things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, yeah, th this might lead into a future uh, podcast that we might want to have in the coming weeks, um, dealing with the, the attack on this very demonstrable quality of, of humanity and its relationship to our political emancipation um, through the arts and the sciences and their, their relationship. But so there's these very verifiable elementary facts that anybody can, can study, come to understand and deploy and, and use to perfect their own um, self-development and, yeah. and just enjoy the fruits of that. That's something we can all access. But one of the biggest um, inhibitors that's been put artificially in the path towards that, that very fruitful process has been the creation, especially throughout the 20th century and especially after World War II, of things like the, con uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom um, right. and certain things that the CIA, which was created in 1947, was wow. induced to, to do as far as cultural warfare, um, which is highly acknowledged at this point. I mean, this has been written about in many books, many articles have studied, and this has been openly acknowledged by the CIA itself, how... Yeah. Um, modern arts, abstract art, a, uh, atonal music, um, all sorts of things like that in, the, in all branches of the arts were cultivated um, with CIA funding after World War II in the combat against the communist Red Scare, which mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was seen that the arts was going to be the battleground of where we would get access to our uh, understanding of our, who we are as a capitalist West versus who they are as a communist uh, East. Right. And uh, I just, I was, I was just writing an article as a teaser maybe for that future discussion we could have um, on the creation of the Cold War. And there was a quote that struck me when I was looking at something called, uh, in Canada, we had this espionage counterintelligence uh, um, operation called Camp X, just in the outskirts of Ottawa, where they basically, it was set up by uh, British intelligence. Um, to train spies and they conducted all sorts of things that, that involving psychological warfare, propaganda, forgeries. And this is sort of the base uh, out, out of which came the five eyes uh, signals operations later on. And one of the key guys who uh, was a major uh, leader of this under William Stevenson um, was a guy, Peter Dwyer. He was the head of counter espionage for the British uh, security cooperation organization that was based in the uh, New York during the war. And he was brought in to run a big chunk of this. And the author of this book, uh, David Stafford writes, the man who impressed Ottawa with his love of the arts had also played an important part in the history of Anglo-Canadian secret intelligence. Um, that was an interesting statement. So I looked into who this guy is. And indeed he was the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Canadian Council of the Arts and Literature. Uh, that was created in 1957 to take sort of federal responsibility from the Rockefeller and Carnegie foundations and the CIA that had formerly been funding primarily the arts, humanities, sociology um, right. in Canada, going back to like 1911. It took control of that and made it a sort of federal thing. And he became the, uh, the head, um, uh, what was he? The, um, the arts uh, coordinator on the executive council of this thing is, and a co-founder um, early on. So you're like, well, is that a coincidence that this guy who was one of the key figures who organized the creation of the, of the Cold War? Um, just like art, Matthew. He just liked art. Stop. Yeah. Did he really just objectively just really like art that had nothing to do with his political identity? See, so it's not just the good guys, so-called. I mean, I, I'm using the word good guys here, but I'm, I'm assuming after this conversation, people uh, know that we're not using na the naive uh, definition of good guys versus bad guys, like from a comic book. But it's yeah. not just those people who had a positive um, effect like Ben Franklin or Poe, whose political identities uh, were tied to their creative output, but rather also on the negative side of things, people like this, you'll find all over the place. You, you can't talk about the, uh, the, the, the artistic creations of an Emerson or a Carlyle or Peter Dwyer's artistic sponsorship and, and passions from their political identities. What role what ideals politically did they see and how do they situate their own role and identity within a political process in their own lifetimes? They're, they're right. two sides of the same coin. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there, it's, it, it, it's a dimension that has to be looked at. It has to be. Yeah. At, at, at the least. And so like, like I said, maybe for a future conversation, we could, we could maybe like unpack that a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
the whole point of art, I, I, there's a, I think it's just, we just need to make the distinction, right? The, the art is not political in that it's not vote for candidate this, or, you know, we need to, you know, whatever, yeah. whether it's shut down ice or, you know, a poem on shut down ice or a poem on the cold war. Like, no, that's not, that's very naive. That's not the role of the artist per se, but to understand the higher strategic dynamics, the different uh, currents of thought, the different philosophical ideas that ultimately uh, shape the, the, the interactions in the real world, right? That shape people's thinking, which shape their actions and which shape events. Uh, you can't really get away from that when you're looking at art. Art is actually one of the key battlegrounds. And I mean, whether you're an evil oligarch, smart oligarch like Algis Huxley or Bertrand Russell, or, you know, you're some high level manager, anybody who's, who's intelligent, who's trying to sort of control uh, people understands that art is important. And I mean, if you don't get that, uh, that's okay, but it is. And with that said, I, I feel like, and maybe this will be a tradition that can be uh, carried on. I think I'd close with uh, a lovely Poe poem from his earlier years, which sort of, based on everything we've been describing, discussing, I think it, it gives a uh, poetic sense of what, what, what that might, you know, uh, an essence of what the struggle is all about. So this is to one in paradise. Thou wast all that to me, love, for which my soul did pine. A green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine, all wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Ah, dream too bright to last, ah, starry hope that didst arise, but to be overcast. A voice from out the future cries, on, on, but o'er the past dim gold, my spirit hovering lies, mute, motionless, aghast. For alas, alas, with me the light of life is over, no more, no more, no more. Such language holds the solemn sea to the sands upon the shore, shall bloom the thunder blasted tree or the stricken eagle soar. And all my days are trances, and all my nightly dreams are where thy dark eye glances, and where thy footstep gleams. In what ethereal dances, by what eternal streams. There's definitely something I think that really speaks to the spirit of Poe, somebody who's struggling with these questions of the infinite and using poetry as a means of really wrestling with these concepts and being able to produce, to, to develop them in a non-literal way, give people the uh, non-literal tools and means of wrestling with ideas. Mm. So I thank, you, Matt, for being yet another fascinating guest for The New Liar. Uh, we love all our guests. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you and all our guests again soon. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And we'll be back again next week. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for doing this. This is a very wonderful project that you've put, uh, put into motion. I think Poe would be very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you.